Hello, kids. It is Mr. McCarthy again with your dose of social studies for the week of April 27th through May 1st. Here we go. We're going to take a look at newspaper number 22. I'm going to introduce you to the words that you need to know. And we'll talk about what your, the expectations are for this week as far as assignments go. Here are our words to know for this week's periodical. Boycott. Chemist. Intermingle. Migrant worker. Mural. Nobel Prize. Ozone layer. Physics. Strike. And union. Yeah, let me... Um, Head over to our assignments. You are going to read all the articles in Studies Weekly, week 22. You're going to answer the questions at the end of each article. And on Friday, you're going to take the open book quiz on Studies Weekly. And as you know, that will count as a classwork grade. So I'm going to show you again how you can access... The periodical, I made it really easy for you. It is available on Studies Weekly, but it's also available right here on my page. So you've already clicked on Lessons for April 21st. You clicked on Social Studies video. That's what you're watching now. Here's where you could get the periodical over to the right. You can pull this up and read it on your own, or as you know, you can read along while you have the website read to you. We are going down to week 22 and week 22 is on contributions to American culture by Hispanic Americans. So this is where you can press play in order to have the website read to you right over here. And instead of doing that right now, what I'd like to do is watch a video on Cesar Chavez. Cesar Chavez, the Hispanic American labor leader, was born in Arizona in 1927. In the 1930s, his family moved to California and became migrant workers, which meant they traveled from place to place to harvest crops such as lettuce, carrots, grapes, and cotton. They moved so often that Mr. Chavez said he attended more than 30 different elementary schools. When he was a young teenager, he dropped out of school to work in the fields with his father so that his mother could stay home. As an adult, he realized that the workers were not treated fairly by the farm owners. They worked long hours for very little money, could be fired at any time, and had no insurance. He read about how people tried to change things in other places. He especially liked the way Mahatma Gandhi, a leader in India, had worked to achieve independence for his country without using violence. This is what he wanted to do, make working conditions better for migrant workers peacefully. Cesar Chavez organized the National Farm Workers Union. Many of the Hispanic migrant workers joined. They would go on strike or refuse to work unless farmers would sign a contract promising better pay and living conditions. Mr. Chavez also asked people not to buy crops grown by those farmers. The most famous strike was against the grape growers. It lasted a long time, but finally the growers signed contracts. Cesar Chavez died in 1993. There are even parks, roads, and schools named for him. They remind us of the hard work and success he had in helping the migrant workers. Can you recall who else was inspired by Mahatma Gandhi? Earlier this year, we learned about a famous leader who was very influential here in the United States that was influenced by Mahatma Gandhi and his belief in nonviolent protest. That's right, Martin Luther King Jr. So, here is how you access the other articles. Go down these rows. So you can read all of them digitally. You can pull up the social studies periodical right here. So this website's pretty amazing. You have a lot of options. 
why don't we check out one more video about Hispanic American contributions to American culture. The only group of people who are truly native to America are Native Americans. The rest of us can trace our roots to ancestors who immigrated to the United States from other countries. One group of Americans who can do this are Hispanics. Hispanics and Latinos can trace their roots to Spain, Mexico, the Caribbean, and Central and South America. Around 50 million Americans call themselves Hispanic or Latino. Their customs and traditions have become a part of the United States culture. Because of this, Congress passed a law stating that September 15th through October 15th is National Hispanic Heritage Month. During this month, Hispanic activities are celebrated all over the United States. Music, food, dancing, and story readings from Latino and Hispanic history and culture are shared. Hispanic authors, poets, artists, and performers share the arts from their ancestors' countries. Hispanic active military men and women and military veterans, as well as those who have or do serve in politics, are honored. Government organizations like the National Archives and Smithsonian Institute join together to recognize the many generations of Hispanic Americans who have added great things to our nation and society. National Hispanic Heritage Month starts on September 15th and not September 1st because five Central American countries celebrate their independence around that day. Those five countries are Costa Rica, El Salvador, Guatemala, Honduras, and Nicaragua. So if you're of Hispanic or Latino heritage, remember to show pride in who you are, especially between September 15th and October 15th. As we make our way down this page and you hit the other articles, you are also going to see your crossword puzzle, which is fun, misspelled words, and your opportunity to collect rev points by doing some, where are the questions? There you go. Here are your trivia questions as well. So make sure that you're understanding and getting the knowledge. One other thing that I would like to um, remind you is that the test will be made available for you on Friday, May 1st. So please make sure you're reading all of the articles. And as we know from our experiences in the classroom, when you do the crossword, this word list right here is really good clue as to what kind of questions they're going to ask you about on the test. So you want to make sure you're paying attention to this word list as well as the one at the beginning of this video. So guys, I'm going to take you on a little bit of a field trip now to the Casillo de San Marcos, and I will say adios. Muchas gracias. Today we are going to explore the oldest masonry fort in the continental U.S., Castillo de San Marcos in St. Augustine, Florida. It's very cool. Castillo de San Marcos was founded by the Spanish crown in 1565. Four countries have occupied the fort, the Spanish, the British, the United States of America, and the Confederate States of America. It first started off as a wooden fort, but after it was attacked by pirates in 1668, the Spanish began construction on a star-shaped masonry fort made of shells. It's from a material called coquina, which means small shells. It's a stone that is made of small shells that have bonded together to form a stone that is similar to limestone. They mined the coquina from a place called King's Quarry on Anastasia Island and brought it over on boats. Native Americans and workers from Havana, Cuba constructed the fort. The Spanish held the fort until 1763 when the British peacefully took it over, but it was returned to the Spanish after the American Revolution in 1783. It was then given to the United States in 1821, 
As part of the Adams Honest Treaty, in 1861, Florida seceded from the United States and became part of the Confederate States of America. But it was taken back by the United States of America in 1862 without firing a single shot. But don't let me do all the talking. A tour guide from the National Park Service told us a few things about the fort too. Uh, in this particular area, it was the Timucuan Indians that they were uh, interested in. That is in fact who they relied on when they first arrived to uh, learn about the different food sources and even the different building materials that were used here, primarily the coquina that the fort's built out of. One of the reasons that the Spanish came to the New World was to spread Catholicism. I'm standing in front of the chapel door which is a very beautiful and ornate door because it is part of the Catholic chapel here inside the Castillo. And from St. Augustine all the way to California, the Spanish will establish missions to reach out to the local tribes. If you get a chance to visit the Castillo, you will find a lot of cannons on our gun deck and on our property. Most of them are authentic. There are only three upstairs on the gun deck that are reproductions because we fire them on the weekends to show people uh, the power behind one of these uh, pieces of artillery. But this particular one that I'm sitting in front of, this is one of two cannons left from 1821 when the Spanish turned the Castillo over to the hands of the United States. This is the lavatory that the Spanish designed to flush. Yes, believe it or not, even back in the 1700s, they had flushing toilets. At high tide, the water would come in and then it would take the waste back out. Sadly, the fort was also used as a prison for American Indians. The first group held there were the Seminoles from the Second Seminole War. This included Chief Osceola. Later, members of Geronimo's band of Chiricahua Apache were imprisoned there along with plain tribes like the Cheyenne and Kiowa. Women and children of the tribe were also held prisoner there, and many died. Let's hear what the park ranger had to say about this unique art form that came out of this tragedy. It's a very sad story for many of them, but it's well journaled through a series of uh, pictures that we call ledger art because it was taken from ledger books, but Captain Pratt gave them paper and, and, and pencils and, and, and let them produce their own artwork to tell their story both on the plains and the journey that they were taken from there to here and what the years while they were imprisoned. And, and that's one really excellent primary source that we have to tell that part of the story. Thank you for visiting Castillo de San Marcos with us. See you next time on Studies Weekly Adventures. And remember to keep exploring.